format of the debate was agreed by the business managers in the Business Bureau. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the Chamber should do so quickly and quietly. Could guests leaving the public gallery please do so as quickly and quietly as possible as this parliament is still in session? Thank you. The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10547 in the name of Hugh Henry on end-to-end -end competition and the Universal Postal Service. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Hugh Henry to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Henry. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Royal Mail is truly a British institution which has embedded itself into British society and British culture. It's one of these institutions that everyone loves. Sure, there will be times when we moan about late delivery or lost mail or indeed the price of postage, but its services are something we have all come to value, whether it's private individuals or businesses the length and breadth of Britain. And we've always supported the standards imposed on our behalf on Royal Mail. We'll betide the politician who threatens to end the universal service obligation which requires Royal Mail to deliver a letter anywhere in Britain for the same standard price and to do so six days per week. That's 29 million addresses which Royal Mail is required to serve. And this obligation is one which is particularly important here in Scotland, given our geography and widely spread small communities. And to some extent, we take for granted the fact that my constituents can post a letter from Linwood to London or Barhead to Bristol for the same cost as posting a letter from Linwood to Barhead. And that becomes even more valuable, uh, an even more valuable benefit if you live in Orkney or Shetland or the Western Isles. And we also take for granted the logistics and the efforts involved in next day working delivery for first class mail and two to three day working delivery for second class mail. And it's not just householders who value the delivery of mail six days per week. This is an important service for businesses all over the country. But just stop to think for a moment about the economics of all of this. It clearly makes no economic sense to charge the same price for a letter from Linwood to London as from Linwood to Barhead. But it does make sense if we look at it as a social obligation which helps to contribute to our quality of life and our sense of well-being. And of course, it doesn't take long to work out that the risks and costs of sending and receiving mail are spread over customers large and small all over the country. And if it were left to an open market, Scotland would surely suffer. It's also important to remember that the Royal Mail relies not just on investment and organisation. It relies on tens of thousands of dedicated staff who take great pride in making sure our mail is delivered efficiently and economically. Many of these staff are out and about at the crack of dawn in all sorts of weather, hail, rain or shine, and that's just the summer, or in Scottish winters in ice and snow, they make sure that we receive our mail. And it's important that they are fairly rewarded for their work. Thanks to the efforts of the Communication Workers' Union, CWU, the pay terms and conditions of staff has improved over the years. It hasn't always been easy, as the union has faced challenges about new technology and new working practices. But what the CWU has achieved in pay, pensions, health and safety, which is important, and general conditions at work, 
I know is the envy of many workers who don't have the protection of a strong campaigning trade union. This is a workforce and a trade union which has adapted to modern demands but never lost sight of fundamental values and purpose. And at the heart of the service which we know and value is that universal service obligation which I mentioned earlier. The Royal Mail has fulfilled its obligation by introducing new technology and working methods to help cope with the challenge of increased competition. But it has also done so by being able to cross-subsidise the cost of low-volume, high-distance, uneconomic mail from the profits made from the high-volume, profitable business or short-distance mail. But all of this is under threat from the encroachment of TNT Post UK or Whistle without an E as it is bizarrely branded. And it beggars belief that some marketing agency somewhere will have been paid a fortune to come up with this. But forget the name. It's what they are doing that's the problem. Royal Mail and its staff are not complaining about competition. They have had to adapt and rise to the challenge, even though that hasn't always been done fairly. But what has now been done is not just unfair in the extreme, but it also brings dangers which threatens the very existence of that service which we all know and cherish. And the onward march of TNT Whistle started off in London and has now steadily moved across the country and will shortly be operating in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Now, it wouldn't be so bad if Whistle had to legally provide the same standard of service as Royal Mail, but Whistle has no interest in developing services in hard-to-reach, high-cost areas. Whistle will not have to bother with the cost of sending mail from London to the Western Isles or to Orkney or Shetland. Whistle will not have to deliver mail six days per week. It can pick and choose the days in which it delivers. And by cherry-picking the high-volume, low-cost, more profitable areas, Whistle deprives the Royal Mail of the revenues it needs to deliver to those remote areas six days a week. And those are areas which Whistle will ignore. And that's not the only unfairness. The hard-won wages and conditions of Royal Mail staff are not available to Whistle employees. Until recently, Whistle operated on zero-hour contracts with pay below the living wage. No wonder Whistle operations have had a high staff turnover. And by driving down wages and conditions, Whistle hopes to undercut Royal Mail in more lucrative markets, thus denying Royal Mail the revenues needed to sustain the universal service obligation of a standard price and standard and, and six-day service. It will also deprive the Royal Mail of the revenue needed to sustain the wages and conditions won by the CWU for its members. And the workers who work in mail delivery deserve decent pay and conditions, and Whistle should not be allowed to undermine this. So when we talk about competition, we are not talking about fair competition, nor are we talking about a level playing field. Whistle will not have to deliver six days per week, nor will it have to collect from post boxes. Uh, and there will be no redirection service and, of course, Whistle will not have to bother with the cost of mail delivery to remote communities across Scotland. What we have here is the biggest threat we have ever seen to the postal service as we know it, and we need to take a stand. The Scottish Government and its agencies, councils and other public sector bodies need to carefully consider the implications of giving contracts to Whistle. But above all, the Scottish Government and the others I have mentioned, along with this Parliament, need to make it clear to Ofcom that action is needed to protect the Royal Mail. Ofcom needs to set aside its complacency and waken up to the threat posed by Whistle to the universal service obligation. Ofcom needs to undertake an urgent and full review of end-to-end -end postal competition, and Ofcom needs to consider regulatory changes to protect the universal postal system. The British public will not thank us if we sit quietly and watch the salami slicing and destruction of our much-valued postal service. It's time to tell TNT to go whistle, and that's with an E. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to congratulate Hugh Henry, my co-convener of the Cross Party Group on Postal Services, for securing this debate and bringing this important matter to the Chamber, and also to thank the CWU for its briefing. There is a growing threat to postal services provided by Royal Mail from businesses like Whistle, formerly TNT Post UK, and the universal service obligation, specifically for poor and rural areas. 
For decades, we've enjoyed our one price goes anywhere, six days a week postal services operated by Royal Mail. The flat rate universal service was economically possible because profits from wealthier, more densely populated areas helped to compensate for the cost of servicing poor and more remote areas. This balance of working across the country is vital for the system to work and for everyone to have equal access to high quality, uh, uh, low cost, six days a week postal services. In October uh, 2011, Westminster passed the Postal Services Act, which enabled the UK government to sell shares in Royal Mail, leading to the privatisation of Royal Mail. This opened up, uh, opened up Royal Mail to greater competition. And Whistle, which is not beholden to deliver the universal service, utilised this unfair advantage, leading in effect to an undermining of Royal Mail's ability to do its job. Whistle began its rival service in April 2012 in West London, at which time, using downstream access competition, it collected and sorted mail from businesses before handing it to Royal Mail to deliver the final mile. Since 2013, it has expanded its business into delivery, establishing an end-to-end -end postal service in direct competition with Royal Mail, and now delivers to 1.2 million of Britain's 29 million addresses through 23 delivery units, delivering three days a week. The firm also has a new co-investor to support expansion to additional parts of the UK and has since expanded to North West, South West and parts of Central London as well as Manchester and Liverpool and as Hugh Henry pointed out uh, will soon be doing so in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Complaints are being made at the poor quality of Whistle services. In July of this year the London Assembly passed a motion calling for a review of Whistle's end-to-end -end services. Labour Party Assembly member Murad Kueshi, who proposed the motion commented and I quote that Delivery companies repeatedly provide poor service and cherry-pick the most lucrative areas to deliver post, undermine the quality of universal postal services and raise questions at the standard of a privatised postal delivery service, adding that the increased number of poor postal service cases, rising costs of delivery and unfair competition in the market has emphasised the need for government to bring the national postal service back into public ownership. Delivery volumes of Whistle remain small compared to Royal Mail's at less than 0.4% of the addressed mail market. However, Royal Mail makes a strong case for such companies to be exposed to the same universal uh, postal service obligation, based on the fact that while smaller in scope, Whistle's delivery rounds are in the most profitable areas. Not being held to the same standard of service, companies like Whistle are able to pick and choose areas they want to collect from and deliver to, so naturally they consume the profits generated from more densely populated regions, damaging the financial sustainability of the Universal Postal Service. Scotland, having its fair share of rural towns and small businesses, is especially vulnerable to this problem of compromised postal services due to unfair competitive practices resulting in privatisation. Much of my own constituency comprises small towns, rural and island areas that are more difficult to access and therefore more costly to collect from and deliver to. But this problem, while it would have a concentrated effect in many areas of Scotland, is not only a localised concern. It is clear that Whistle is not prepared to offer staff the same terms and conditions as Royal Mail, with low wages and, as we have heard, uh, had zero hour contracts. Ultimately, their growth can only cost the jobs of Royal Mail workers and ensure a steady decline of Royal Mail employment and, ultimately, the viability of the entire postal service, which inevitably will look to cut costs even more sharply to compete. As of last week, MPs agreed to launch an inquiry into competition in the postal industry, examining the universal service obligation and the unfair advantages rival businesses have as they attempt to build their direct delivery services. Ofcom committed to review the direct delivery market by the end of next year. Presiding officer, in light of the immediacy of this problem, the rate at which companies like Whistler are expanding and negatively impacting on revenues allocated to universal service, I ask the Scottish Government to join in urging Ofcom to accelerate this timetable to determine as soon as possible any regulatory changes needed, such as freezing end-to-end -end competition at its current level to ensure that high-quality postal services are maintained and protected for every home in Scotland and across the UK. Thank you, Thank you very much. I now call Gavin Brown to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, congratulating Hugh Henry on securing this debate and on thanking all those organisations who submitted briefs to MSPs in advance of the debate taking place. Uh, there are a number of areas where I agree with what Hugh Henry has said. There are a number of areas where I disagree with what Hugh Henry has said. Um, but ultimately, I think his call uh, for an urgent review to take place is something which I uh, would support. Uh, and think a case has been made uh, for that to happen sooner rather than later. Um, he rightly pointed out just how vital the universal service obligation is to all parts of the UK. It is, I think, a fundamental part 
of our economy. It is a fundamental part, ultimately, of our society. And it is something that people, individuals, families and businesses up and down the country rely upon. And it's something that I don't think any politician or any political party would want to lose in any way. Uh, there is a UK government commitment to it, but there is a far broader and wider political commitment to it as well. And it's right that we have a statutory duty of a universal six-day-a-week service at uniform prices. And I would certainly be concerned by anything which can be proven uh, to put this at risk. When I disagree with, with Hugh Henry slightly on what I think he was driving at, I don't ultimately see competition in itself as something to be afraid of or something that we need to push back against. There can be benefits to it, but there are risks with it, obviously, too. The benefits, as I see it, are it can strengthen incentives. Sure, happy, happy to give away. Hugh Henry. I think I made the point in my speech that both Royal Mail and the CWU have actually accepted and face up to competition over the years. The complaint is not about competition. It's about unfair competition. Gavin Brown. Point. I, I just felt the remarks made it, particularly the end of Mr Henry's speech, uh, suggested that he was against competition, full stop, but um, he, may, he may indeed not be. It can offer benefits, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it can strengthen incentives on Royal Mail to improve their efficiency and to reduce costs. And I think ultimately it can benefit customers uh, through increased innovation and value-added services. But I think where there are risks put forward and where a case is seriously put forward, as I think it has been, um, we have to look at it uh, quite carefully. Ofcom's primary duty, of course, is to secure the provision of, universal, of, provision of the universal service. It has a duty uh, to promote competition where that benefits consumers. But as Vince Cable pointed out some months ago, where the duties are in conflict, the universal service takes precedence. So I think where we get to and what we have to, to look at quite seriously is to demonstrate as clearly as possible in an analytical way where the current situation does pose a risk to the universal service, to what extent does it do so, and to put forward, I think, uh, as clearly as possible why we believe that uh, to be the case. Now, the Royal Mail formally requested a review from Ofcom, Ofcom in July and August of this year and as I understand it, while meetings have taken place, I've been unable to find, and I'm certainly unaware of, any official public response from Ofcom in relation to that request. Uh, one of the documents put before MSPs in advance of the debate came from the community union, uh, who, were, uh, who were aligned with uh, Whistle in this regard, stating that in August of this year, they too uh, wrote to Ofcom calling for an early review of the USO on the grounds that such a review would clarify the future of the sector for workers, businesses and the general public. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and some, to some extent we end up in the same place uh, as Hugh Henry, that I think actually an official response uh, is required into this. I think the review sought should be given serious consideration. Um, and anything which jeopardises uh, the universal serv service obligation is something that would concern me greatly. And as a consequence, I think... Uh, Ofcom really ought to think about uh, bringing the review forward. It's meant to happen by the end of next year, or at least to begin by the end of next year. Uh, the evidence I've seen so far suggests that it ought to happen far sooner than that. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Jenny Mara to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking and congratulating my colleague Hugh Henry for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today? And let me start by echoing colleagues' unstinting support for the universal service obligation. It is still in our country a delight and a cherished wonder that you can pop a first-class stamp on a postcard in Ullapool and be confident that it, that it arrives in the thronging metropolis of London the very next morning to be read over breakfast. Indeed, just this morning I went to the post office to replenish a book of first-class stamps in my purse, and who knows where on these islands I'll use them and for what purpose. Reflecting today on the wonder of this service, none of us can be in any doubt that it is one of the many important and emotional ties that bind us into the UK, an emotional and practical arrangement backed up by legislation at UK and EU levels. Presiding officer, competition has become mandatory in postal services as a result 
of the Postal Services Directive from the European Union. Transposed into UK law by the Labour government, there was and is no opt-out on Postal Services Directive as long as we are members of the European Union, which all members across this chamber, I think, support. So the challenge becomes to finally balance competition arrangements to protect and strengthen the universal service obligation, whilst maintaining the quality of jobs across different employers in the sector. And to that end, presiding officer, our trade unions, the Communication Workers Union in the gallery today representing Royal Mail workers and community representing whistle workers, are both doing a fine job of working with employers to enhance training and support the modernisation of working practices in the sector, while securing an agreement to end zero hours contracts of whistle workers, I understand, secure pay increases and improvements in health and safety. And these are measures, presiding officer, which workers across all postal services providers will support, I am sure, to maintain standards across their industry. Now, the job of finally balancing and making fair, as Hugh Henry pointed out, the competition arrangements in the UK falls to Ofcom. And I welcome and support Hugh Henry's call for a review of end-to-end -end postal competition to determine the regulatory changes that are needed to protect the universal service obligation. An arrangement as precious and fundamental as the USO needs to be constantly scrutinised so we can strengthen, improve and sustain it in a constantly evolving postal market and that standards in the industry for all workers can be maintained and strengthened by the arrangements put in place. In an industry where we have seen a marked decline in letter delivery as online billing and emails are cheaper for consumers and business, we have to be innovative within the rules of the EU Postal Services Directive to strengthen and maintain the universal service obligation far into the future. A Royal Mail, as the designated provider of the USO, by law, must be allowed a fair playing field to deliver its obligation and maintain standards in their practices. This is absolutely necessary and fair. They are the designated provider by law and they must be allowed to provide it. I understand, presiding officer, that a scheduled review is due to take place in 2015, but if it, if it is necessary to bring it forward, then Ofcom should heed this call to do so. As Hugh Henry said, we must make sure there is no unfair competition, but finally balance the competition rules. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I too congratulate uh, Hugh Henry on uh, securing this debate? And I think Hugh Henry and Jenny Mara both uh, rightly set the context of the special place that the Royal Mail has I think, in the affections of uh, people across the UK. I think um, after two minutes of Hugh Henry's speech, I thought he was going to break the all-time record of references to um, Britain uh, in, uh, in a parliamentary speech in this, uh, in this place. But it does, it reflects the importance that the Royal Mail has um, to all of our constituents. But um, I think uh, Hugh Henry was also fair to acknowledge the particular significance that the universal service obligation has uh, for constituents uh, in, in, in Ireland and rural areas uh, such as those I represent, not just for individuals and households, but also, I think, for, uh, for small businesses. Now, maybe if I've got time, touch on the issue of high delivery charges, which is related to this and is such a touchstone issue uh, for my constituents. I think the, the motion itself is, is very fair in, in outlining the concerns that, that, that quite uh, demonstrably exist. And the proposals, I think, uh, are reasonable. As Kenny Gibson and uh, Gavin Brown indicated, there is a, a review plan for the end of next year. But given what we're seeing in terms of the development of the market, the aspirations that Whistle and possibly others have, I think there is now a pretty compelling case for bringing forward and accelerating that review. And it seems to be a view uh, shared by the community union, uh, whose briefing I thought was very helpful, although I would uh, 
disagree with some aspects of it. I think there is now evidence that the direct delivery competition is putting strain on Royal Mail's uh, ability to honour uh, the universal service obligation. And, and Whistle argue that the agreements are subject to negotiation with Royal Mail uh, on the basis of cost, but I don't think those costs reflect the costs of delivering to places like Orkney and other rural communities across the UK, nor, uh, as Hugh and Henry indicated, uh, are Whistle bound by the requirements uh, that Royal Mail is uh, as the universal service uh, provider. But the universal service obligation is critically important as a, as a principle in spreading and socialising the costs across customers throughout uh, the UK. But it's more than just a principle. I mean, for people in, in, in Orkney and other uh, rural areas, for, for small businesses in my constituency, for example, it's vital. It's often the way in which the playing field is levelled with competition from businesses in other parts uh, of the country. And it goes beyond businesses too. The recent uh, Citizens Advice Scotland uh, report on delivery charges highlighted the extent of the problem we've got uh, in that area. A third of the respondents uh, from Orkney said that they'd been subject to surcharges uh, for uh, goods sent to uh, Orkney. A quarter uh, had found that there were businesses that would refuse to deliver to Orkney at all. And I think the same applies to many other parts of the Highlands uh, and Islands. I've taken this up with a number of the com companies involved. And to be fair, some, when confronted with the, the evidence, are prepared to review uh, their charging policy and re review the delivery charges. Some of them re remove them entirely. Often they'll reduce them. Uh, some will just be more upfront about those costs right at the, the outset. But still, in too many cases, there is an un unwillingness uh, to look at alternatives. And I think while this is a distinct issue from that of the universal service obligation, the concerns highlighted uh, by Hugh Henry in his motion, I think it's related and what we need to avoid is a, seeing a similar situation starting to emerge in relation uh, to the letters market. The Royal Mail has, I think, um, uh, adapted to the challenges it faces, whether in terms of new technology, in terms of competition, uh, and in terms of the affordability of pensions even. Uh, but we can't expect it to continue to do so while also requiring it um, to, to, to make that fight with one hand tied behind it, its back. As I say, I congratulate Hugh Henry on bringing this uh, debate uh, to Parliament. I think the call for an urgent review by Ofcom is an entirely reasonable one that appears to be garnering support across the political spectrum and actually within the industry itself. Uh, and I hope uh, to, to see uh, some progress made on that in the months ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. And I now call our final open debate speaker, Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. I also welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate this afternoon on our post of services. Services which are changing, services which are now exposed to new com competitive pressures and services which are absolutely vital to businesses and communities the length and breadth of Scotland. So I'd also like to congratulate Hugh Henry for bringing this motion to the Chamber. He does so at a time when the future of postal services across the UK, including the preservation of the universal service obligation is extremely topical. Not only have we learned that Business, Innovation and Skills Select Committee has launched an inquiry into the sustainability of the universal service obligation, but it has also been a whole year since the botched privatisation of Royal Mail. The sale of Royal Mail was opposed by two thirds of the British public and the National Audit Office have confirmed that the government's valuation of Royal Mail was too cautious. According to the Select Committee, the huge undervaluing of Royal Mail, Royal Mail has cost taxpayer, taxpayers well over a billion pounds. The Communication Workers Union believe that there are even more consequences arising from the Royal Mail sell-off than the government are prepared to admit. And today I want to set out what I believe those consequences might be and I want to explain why I believe there is a need for swift action to guarantee a good, fair, affordable service for people and businesses at all, the 29, at all 29 million of the UK addresses. Firstly, as expected, the privatisation of Royal Mail has led to competition for end-to-end -end services. But workers in that sector and those who depend on those services need to be sure that competition in this market is fair. The market share of a company like TNT Post or Whistle, as it is now known, might be small, but it's also growing. Whereas Royal Mail must provide services in both profitable and non-profitable routes, services which are cross-subsidised. Other operators can deliver services focused on specific routes. 
Some, though not all, would say that effectively this leads to <coughs> cherry-picking of the best routes and undermines Royal Mail's capacity to deliver universally. Whether there is evidence of cherry-picking or not, there is clearly a need for the regulator to step in and give clarity to those who work in Royal Mail, Whistle and their customers, as well as the trade unions, both the CWU, who organise in Royal Mail, and Community, who organise in TNT. Royal Mail's Chief Executive, Moya Green, is on record as saying that the business model of new operators is striking at the economics of the universal service obligation. When Royal Mail was being sold off, we were told that the universal service obligation would remain. We were told that one stamp would still go anywhere for six days a week at a price that is affordable to consumers and small businesses. The universal service obligation is up for review next year. It must be sustained but Ofcom must also exercise its power as regulator to ensure that competition in this new market is fair for all. There is a statutory requirement in Ofcom to safeguard the Universal Postal Service, and so it must bring forward an immediate review of end-to-end -end competition. Presiding officer, now that the Royal Mail has been privatised, there must be a concerted effort from government and from regulators to ensure that the universal service obligation remains intact. The message from this Parliament today must be that our postal services are essential, and so the new market that is emerging must be fair, and it must work for consumers, for workers and for businesses across the country. Thank you. Many thanks. And can I now invite Derek Mackay to respond to the debate. Minister, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Members will be aware in this very consensual uh, debate that I'm not the lead minister for this subject, but Fergus Ewan, who apologises, it was unable to make the debate, but I know he takes a, a very particular interest in the subject. It was largely consensual, and I'll finish with a, a recommendation that I believe the Scottish Government can take forward. Uh, but I'm slightly surprised that the most controversial speech was from Margaret McCulloch in terms of uh, going further on some of the comments on privatisation, comments that, of course, we would uh, concur with in terms of the, the, the conduct of that sale. Uh, but it's about the consequences uh, of that and the other matters that have been raised we now focus on. And in that sense, I would too would congratulate Hugh Henry for securing this debate and ensuring that uh, the issue it is raised and we all take, I think, the availability of postal services for granted. And it is therefore important that these services are scrutinised by this Parliament, even though we do not have a direct control. Postal services are, of course, a vital lifeline for many of Scotland's communities, both to individuals and to businesses, as we have heard, who rely on a prompt and efficient service. The universal service obligation is particularly important to remote and rural communities and ensures that uniformity of costs and deliveries and uplifts throughout the country, irrespective of location. Royal Mail has that statutory obligation to provide this universal service and it is therefore important to ensure Royal Mail's ability to provide it is also maintained. This debate reflects the widespread concern over Royal Mail's belief that its ability to continue to provide the universal service is indeed under threat. Ofcom has the statutory responsibility in this area and has powers to regulate postal services even before uh, the review mechanism uh, is, is in place. It must continue to act to ensure, therefore, that the universal service obligation is safeguarded this debate has allowed MSPs of all parties to discuss concerns about that current regulatory regime. In terms of Hugh Henry's key point, it's about not necessarily being against competition. competition. That debate has largely been had, but it must be a level playing field in which that, that uh, safeguarding commitment can be maintained. Uh, Kenny Gibson's point around the equality of service across the, uh, the country Indeed, as well, the, the impact of privatisation as well and the nature of cherry-picking a number of members picked up in that uh, point. Uh, a number of members also raised the parliamentary uh, review and Ofcom's monitoring uh, regime. Uh, both uh, Kenny Gibson and Hugh Henry uh, called for us to accelerate that monitoring. All members uh, agreed on uh, an early review of the situation. And I suppose I was particularly surprised and glad to hear 
Gavin Brown and Liam McCaffrey also call for that piece of work and that process. So I think we should certainly uh, take that forward. In terms of the commitment and the duty, of course, it will be undermined by the reality on the ground. We can have the commitment and the duty, but if it is undermined by that unfair competition, then that clearly must be studied. Uh, Jenny Mara, of course. Liam McCarthy. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. I wonder, um, given that this is a members' debate, there won't be a vote on it. I'm sure Ofcom are, are, are watching um, the proceedings here with great interest. But perhaps there might be an opportunity for a cross-party approach to Ofcom, uh, along with the, uh, the, the Scottish Government, to make the case for accelerating that review, which I think would reflect the sentiments that we've heard this afternoon. Minister? Well, I'm a consensual kind of guy and uh, we're happy to commit Mr Ewing. I was going to commit Mr Ewing to write to the UK government again, uh, but I'm more than happy if we want to do it on a cross-party basis as well. I do think that that would add strength to the point that uh, the members' uh, debate uh, has raised, so I see no reason to take that forward. I was already going to commit the Scottish government to do that in light of this debate, and I think that uh, reinforces uh, the point. Jenny Mara, I think very helpfully, uh, covered the, the maintenance of wider standards of, of, of postal services and uh, Royal Mail. And of course, uh, Mr MacArthur, you did cover the crucial island uh, and rural perspective. So uh, in taking the debate forward, it is the position of, of Scottish Government to pursue this. Mr Ewing had written to UK Government, who at that point felt that Ofcom were carrying out their duties effectively. There are... Uh, measures that could be put into place to challenge us, but they felt at that time, earlier this year, when Mr Ewing did write, uh, that there was no reason to intervene at that point. But I think some of the evidence we've heard today could inform our uh, response and follow-up to, to that uh, inquiry and accelerate the, the monitoring and the review uh, with the experience uh, that we have taking into account uh, what the trade unions have said as well. So although the postal services are reserved, the UK government being responsible, it doesn't mean that we don't take action. So we do in the nature uh, that, in the way that's been suggested by members across the chamber today, because we do expect the government and Ofcom to act in the interests uh, of uh, Scotland and our uh, services. And we'll, we'll take that forward in the consensual a way that's been suggested, because I think this debate has highlighted the concerns that exist. They have to be taken seriously so that we can effectively guarantee the uh, universal service uh, here. And I uh, found it a very constructive and helpful debate to have. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes Hugh Henry's debate on end-to-end -end competition and the universal postal service. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm.